Are you a superstitious person, Ray? Not really. I mean, I guess I have a few, let's call them habits. Okay. Like what? Well, I have to tap on the airplane before I get in for a trip. Okay. And I have to drink a Bloody Mary mix on the flight. <laughs> All right. So a little airplane ritual. Yeah. So would you panic if you sat down in your airplane seat and you realized you forgot to tap the plane? I don't know. I mean, I, I can't imagine forgetting. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I get that. Well, so travel is dangerous. And if a little habit, like say, carrying a St. Christopher medal if you're Catholic or, or saying a prayer or tapping on the plane makes you feel better, then so be it. I mean, the reality either way is that with travel, a lot of factors are out of your control. So we're standing by the boat docks in Kenny Bunkport, Maine. There's fishing boats and things like that. Mm -hmm. At this time of the year, all of the pleasure boats and yachts are someplace warmer. And we're talking about superstitions and travel. Right. Does this week's story have something to do with a boat? <laughs> that it does, Ray. A ghostly ship that still haunts the waters of coastal Maine. A tragedy and story that inspired songs and books. Today, we're searching for the wreck of the cursed ship Isidore. Hello, I'm Jeff Belanger, and welcome to episode 226 of the New England Legends podcast. If you give us about 15 minutes, we'll give you something strange to talk about today. And I'm Ray Osher. Thank you for joining us on our mission to chronicle every legend in New England one story at a time. We're a community of legend seekers, always exploring the odd history, ghosts, monsters, and strangeness that make New England unique. And most of our story leads come from you, like this one. Thanks to Grant Thompson for contacting us about the legend of the Isidore. If you know a strange tale, you can contact us through our website, our free New England Legends app that you can download right now on your smartphone, through social media, or in our super secret Facebook group. Now, before we go looking for the ghost ship Isidore, we need to take just a minute to tell you about our sponsor, Nuati Herbals. You know, Christmas is practically upon us. Right. Which means hopefully we'll get plenty of Nuati Herbals under our trees this year. This is a holiday for traditions, new traditions. That's why we thought we'd hear from Santa. Ho, ho, ho. Santa wants to start a new tradition this year. Out with the milk and cookies and in with the tea and cookies. I called Rod Jackson, founder of Nawadi Herbals. He's a good buddy of mine. He makes 22 of the best herbal teas and has assured me that they have plenty of tea on hand to handle the Christmas Eve rush. Merry Christmas to all. And don't forget to set out a plate of cookies with hot tea for me. Mmm, tea and cookies sound pretty good right now. But don't forget, Nuati Herbals has many other products to finish up your holiday shopping list. Soaps, balms, essential oils, bath salts, even products for your pets. Please support the people who are supporting us. Let Nuati Herbals help support your healthy lifestyle. Check out the Nuati Herbals website to see all their great products. And, of course, you legendary listeners, you get 20% off your order when you use the promo code LEGENDS20 at checkout. Visit NuatiHerbals.com. That's N-U-W-A-T-I, Herbals, with an S, dot com. All right, Jeff, we're looking for a ghost ship off the coast of Kennebunkport, Maine. That we are. It's a ship called Isidore, and this is where she made her ill-fated maiden voyage. A voyage that maybe could have been postponed if the captain and crew had heeded their premonitions. So let's head back to 1842 and meet Captain Leander Foss. It's late November of 1842 here in Kennebunk, Maine. The leaves are all gone and the winter's chill seems to be arriving early this year. Still, no matter the weather, fishermen need to fish and ships need to sail. Livelihoods depend on it. Recently, there's been a new addition to the Kennebunk Harbor, a ship called Isidore. The Isidore is a bark owned by Captain Leander Foss. Now, the thing about Captain Foss is that they say he's unlucky. There's stories of his first vessel going down on her maiden voyage. He's so unlucky, some say that when he and his wife were buying a family burial plot, his wife asked to be buried nowhere near her husband's grave. <laughs> oh, sailors are a superstitious bunch to begin with. And the day the Isidore was being launched into the water from the boat docks, she got stuck on the ramp and had to be pried loose to get into the water. That is an unlucky omen. I mean, a ship that isn't eager to get into the water doesn't bode well, does it? No, it doesn't. The plan for the Isidore is that she's to set sail on November 30th with a cargo of hay and potatoes bound for New Orleans. Captain Foss is readying his crew of 15 men to sail in just a few days. 
It's November 26th when the Isidore's carpenter, a man named Tom King, has a strange dream. The dream rattles him to the point where he shares it with his wife and a few friends down by the docks. I dreamed I was standing on the deck of the Isidore, looking out toward the shore. That's when I saw seven coffins laid side by side on the beach. I called out to no one in particular, asking, Who are the coffins for? For the crew of the Isidore, is the reply I heard. Tom has this dream for three nights in a row, and by the third night, both he and his wife are rattled to the point where Tom decides he's not going to sail on the 30th. Not only is this bad form to leave your captain and crew shorthanded, it's illegal. But Tom can't shake the horrible feeling inside. By the morning of November 30th, he's nowhere to be found. Captain Foss is furious at being without his ship's carpenter, but they have a schedule to keep. And even worse, no one on the Isidore's 15-man crew seem comfortable as they ready the ship. Crewman John Crowder says he's heard dogs howling outside of his home for the last three nights in a row. Crewman Paul Grant had his own dream about coffins. This morning, crewman William Harding was standing on the deck staring at the Isidore and was overheard saying, I wish she was a thousand miles out to sea and I was on shore. Despite all these bad feelings and omens, and a few snow flurries in the air, the crew and captain need to earn a living. The potatoes and hay are heading to New Orleans today. It's the afternoon of November 30th when the Isidore sets sail under cloudy skies with a crew of 15, plus one passenger, a fellow ship captain, who is hitching a ride to New Orleans. The skies grow dark fast, and the wind picks up. The wind is coming from the northeast, and that's when Captain Foss knows... He's made a mistake. Soon, a nor'easter bears down on the Isidore, only a couple hours into her maiden voyage. Captain Foss orders the ship to get closer to the coastline in the hopes they can find some kind of harbor to wait out the storm. But the weather is so bad, they can't make out any landmarks or lights to tell them where they are. Visibility is only a few feet. Snow is pelting the ship and piling up on the decks of the Isidore. The sea is growing angrier by the minute. Still heading south, Captain Foss pulls the ship to starboard, knowing the shore is somewhere to the west. Maybe he can beach the ship on some sand if they can just get close enough to see it. But the visibility is so low, and the seas are so rough, and all they can do is pray to see some sign or lights on land. Captain Foss squints, believing maybe that's land just ahead, when suddenly... A mighty gale shoves the Isidore right up against the rocks of Cape Nettie, destroying the ship and dooming the 16 men on board to the icy waters of the Atlantic and the jagged rocks of Cape Nettie, just eight miles away from where they embarked out of Kennebunkport. By the following morning, with the Nor'easter moving out to sea, the wreck of the Isidore is discovered under more than a foot of snow. Only seven bodies are even found. The rest lost at sea. Wow, seven bodies, seven coffins, just like in Tom King's dream. This is so tragic. The Bangor Daily Whig and Courier newspaper covers the story on December 5th. Go ahead and give this a read, Ray. All right, it says, It becomes our duty to record one of the most distressing disasters by sea that has ever taken place in our vicinity. On Wednesday night last, the Bark Isidore, bound for New Orleans was driven ashore in a gale on Cape Nettick Rocks, a few miles south of Wells Village, and totally wrecked. And melancholy to relate, every person on board, consisting of 16 men, perished. Five of the crew were fathers of families and have left 20 children. Two were young men who were only sons, and their mothers are widows. This is all so tragic. And the worst part is that these are the same rocks where a ship called... The William Fales also wrecked just nine months ago, killing eight men. For years, sailors have been asking for a lighthouse at the tip of Cape Nettick, a lighthouse that may have saved two dozen lives this year alone. And that brings us back to today. The lighthouse for Cape Nettick was finally approved in 1874, with construction completed in 1879, much too late for the crew of Isidore or the William Fales and surely dozens of other vessels that could have had a safe trip with the light to guide them. Though the Isidore wrecked all those years ago, her ghost ship still roams these waters. But most people don't dig any deeper than the strange ghostly sighting. I mean, maybe they rub their eyes, look out to sea again, and shrug, asking no more questions as to the name of the ship or her story. 
Now, one of the strangest parts about the Wreck of the Isidore is that most people of coastal Maine seem to have forgotten about the tragedy. Maybe because it was so long ago, we just don't feel a connection. But there is one Mainer who is determined to keep the Isidore on our minds. This is Harvey Reed. I'm a singer-songwriter troubadour from York Village, Maine. Harvey wrote the song The Wreck of the Isidore and three other songs about this tragedy that appear on his The Great Sad River album. He also wrote the book The Wreck of the Isidore, A Glimpse into the Hidden History of Maine. Harvey, how did you find out about the wreck and what inspired you to write the song? For me, it was pure accident, which I attempted to conclude might have been some kind of fate because I'm a musician and a songwriter with a great interest in traditional music and I sing a lot of old ballads and I've always thought it would be fun to write my own little uh, kind of shipwreck ballad and because my family was involved in shipbuilding in Maine and so um, years ago I bought a, a book at the Maine Maritime Museum called Shipwrecks of Maine and I was always intending one day to open that and get some ideas for a song and I just happened to open it one day and it was November 30th 2000 and I was flipping through the book just mostly looking at pictures of shipwrecks and then uh, there it is there's a picture that's of a just a crappy black and white picture of a of a tombstone and it had the name of my town on it and it said had this inscription and I'm going wow that's pretty cool November 30th 1842 Captain Leander Foss wrecked together with 16 men in Cape Natick, Maine. And I'm going, well, that's interesting. That was November 30th. And it was like, ooh. And uh, it said the ship's name was the Isidore. And I thought, well, that's a nice sounding name. I started trying to write a song and I I got a line. And somewhere I still have the little computer file where I sang the the melody in the first line. And uh, I realized I needed to learn something about the ship and dig in and find out what happened. And uh, Um, Here I am, 20 years later, still learning about it and thinking about it. It turned out to be quite a story. So, Harvey, you live in Maine, right where the wreck occurred. How is it that locals didn't know about this tragedy that took 16 lives? Well, there's there's your question. I mean, all stories get lost unless there's something keeping them alive. To me, that's what became the, the interesting thing about the Isidore was there was two stories. There was the, there was what happened, and then there was why does nobody know anymore? And I live a block from a pretty impressive place called the, the York Historical Society. It's one of the major attractions here. Is people can go look at gravestones and take tours about the past. And I went and talked to the people there. They had a big library of stuff, and they didn't know anything about it. I thought, well, this is the town the thing wrecked in. And then I went well, 10 miles as the crow flies, but half an hour up the coast where they built the ship and where all the guys were from who were on the ship. I went to the Kennebunkport Historical Society and they had a fat folder and they knew all about it. So there's this provincial thing, Maine. If you live in a small town, you don't go anywhere else. And the people that here were creeped out by that. All of a sudden there's all these dead bodies on their town that they didn't know who they were. There was massive funerals up in uh, Kennebunk and, the, you know, the churches were overflowing. It was a big deal to have all those people um, perish on the maiden voyage. And, and there were then, a, so every, people were very creeped out by this. And it was a time, I think, when even just the idea of bad luck wasn't very popular. It was a religious time and it was either God's will or it was this weird stuff called superstition, which was kind of witchcraft. That's my take, is that it was just an uncomfortable thing to think about. Just a whole bunch of guys ranging from 15 to about 43 just get dashed to pieces on the meanest piece of rock anywhere in southern Maine. Just a horrible, horrible thing. And they did nothing to deserve it. So the event, of course, makes people of York, Maine uncomfortable. This is a tragic accident with dead bodies. And missing bodies. Right. I can see how it's the kind of thing you want to put behind you. So Harvey talked a lot about Thomas King, the Isidore's carpenter. I think this guy is the key to the survival of the story. I mean, think about it. He had these horrible prophetic dreams. He hid when he was supposed to sail. And then the Isidore goes down on its maiden voyage and everyone on board was lost. Had Thomas King been there, he would have died too. 
Harvey explained how Thomas King hid in the woods for a few days to get out of this voyage. Imagine if you were him. These troubling dreams scared you out of your duties, and, and then you learn that the fear and premonitions literally saved your life. I imagine you'd share the story with a few people, and then piece together the other stories you heard from the crew members' families about the barking dogs, bad dreams, and the overheard comments. Those other stories would validate King's actions. Still, Thomas King had survivor's guilt. He left Kennebunk shortly after the tragedy and started a new life in New Hampshire. But King is our survivor. I think he's the key to turning this from another tragic wreck, a statistic like the William Fails, to a legendary wreck that maybe didn't have to happen if only the crew would have heeded their premonitions the way Thomas King did. Which brings us to the ghost ship sightings. Right. There's something powerful about standing where a tragedy took place. When you're talking about maritime history, shoot, practically the whole coast has seen something bad happen over the last four centuries. Sure. But any strange sightings around Cape Nettick gets attached to the Isidore. Harvey, have you heard about any ghost ship sightings? You know, I've probably done 15 November 30th concerts, trying to keep the story alive. And one of them I I did right in the, um, there's an art museum about a quarter mile, just around one peninsula over from where the ship wrecked. I did a concert there and a guy came up to me after the show. He said, can I talk to you for a second? And he said, you know, I'm really glad you're talking about this. I wish you'd talk more about the ghost stuff, he said, because I'm a fisherman around here. And me and my friends have all seen weird stuff and, and we're afraid to talk about it. And and he, he said, yeah, that there, there was I can't remember the term he used where there's a where you see a wake where a ship is obviously there and there's no ship there. And he said that's the thing that that him and his friends see the most. Because I had heard that the fishermen were still talking about this, but I actually, you know, did meet a guy who um, very sincerely wanted me to uh, talk more about that, which I think is uh, that in fact gives me a little bit of a chill, even as I'm sitting here. Ooh, I'm getting a chill too. Uh, fishermen and sailors know what a ship's wake looks like. They're not going to mistake it for something else. It's their business to know. And maybe the legend of the Isidore is a cautionary tale. Maybe it's a warning to respect the sea, but. Also a reminder to listen to those gut feelings and omens. It could just save your life because travel is dangerous. We'll let Harvey Reed take us out on this one with his song, The Wreck of the Isidore. She'd scarce left the bay when the weather gave way. Wind blew into a gale. Darker grew the sky. The snow filled the sail. And we sing once more of the Isidore Of the cold New England sea Where the hand of fate and a sailor's life Forever twined shall be Harvey Reed's song is haunting. Mm. Uh, To me, the most troubling part of the legend is that the Isidore is not unique. There have been countless others where lives were lost and children orphaned, but this story caught the attention of a troubadour. Someone emailed us about it, and we all keep it alive. The reality is travel is inherently dangerous. We don't always reach our destinations, so we share these tales and connect with our past. Connecting is what we're all about. We'd appreciate it if you'd connect with us and become one of our growing number of Patreon patrons who support everything we do. Call it a holiday gift for your buddies Jeff and Ray. (laughs) Now, for just three bucks per month, you get early access to new episodes, plus bonus episodes and content you can't get anywhere else. If you can help us continue to grow and bring you new stories each week, head over to patreon.com slash New England Legends to sign up. Please be sure to subscribe to our podcast because it's free and we'll tell you a new story each and every Thursday, just as we've done for the past 226 weeks in a row. And tell a friend or two about our show. It helps our community grow. We'd like to thank Michael Leggy for lending his voice acting talents this week. Thank you to Harvey Reed for talking to us and sharing his song, The Wreck of the Isidore. You can find his music on places like iTunes and his book on Amazon and other booksellers. And we'll have links to his website from ours. Just click on episode 226. We'd also like to thank our sponsor, Nuwadi Herbals, and our theme music is by John Judd. Until next time, remember, the bazaar is closer than you think.